Hello and welcome to our 7-8 minutes of weekly Torah talk. Our guest today is Rabbi Jim Ponet, a lecturer in law at Yale Law School and the Howard Holtzman Jewish chaplain at Yale. Hello, Rabbi, and thank you for being with us. Hello, Shmuel. Thank you for having me. Good to be here. Our Parsha is by Akhel. In this Parsha, Moses assembles the people of Israel and talks about their observance of Shabbat. He then moves to convey God's instructions regarding the making of the Mishkan, the tabernacle. A team of artisans make the Mishkan and its furnishings, the roof, the veil, the ark, the table, the menorah. And here is the first pasuk of the parsha, Vayakhel Moshe et kol adat bnei Yisrael vayomer aleihem, ela advarim asher tziva Adonai laasot otam. Moses called the whole community of the children of Israel to assemble and he said to them, these are the things that the Lord commanded to make. So Rabbi, the parsha begins quite strangely, isn't it? Yes, the Parsha begins uh, uh, presumably the day after Moses comes down from the mountain with the second tablets. He spent 40 days up there placating an enraged deity. A strange uh, event has occurred. We'll right. refer to that, of course. He's down now, uh, and he's gotten that God to agree that he will, in fact, go with this people. He'll be present to the people. Uh, and it looks like he's going to give, again, the instructions uh, for the building of a space in which this presence will reside. But the next pasuk, right? Yeah, I, I just read the first one, and you I maybe I should have I should have I, I should have read the, the second one as well. I think so. I think you need to hear the second one to hear how curious this parsha is and how powerful. Because the second verse is Shesha Jamin Te Asem Alacha Vayomashvi Yelachem Kodish Shabbat Shabbaton Ladonai Kolha Osevo Melacha Yumat. The second verse is, six days you shall work, or rather, six days shall work be done, passive voice. Right. On the seventh day, it will be holy, a Shabbat Shabbaton, a rest or a cessation within a cessation, a right. deep sense of rest, the doubling of Shabbat Shabbaton. Anybody who works on that day will be put to death. Right. That's the second verse. So he starts off saying, I'm going to tell you about building, and he begins by telling you about the need not to do any building on the Shabbat. Yeah, we thought we were going to talk about the Mishkan again, and we're suddenly talking about Shabbat. Exactly. So, so we do know, of course, the tradition, uh, the halacha understands that the uh, 39 forbidden categories of work that are not allowable on Shabbat do derive from that which was required to build the Mishkan. But more importantly, this instruction to build the Mishkan comes after another building project. Right. There are really two major building projects before this one in the book of Exodus. The first major building project is forced upon us, the Israelites, by Pharaoh, building the uh, garrison cities of Ramses and Pitom. Right. This is forced labor, corvée labor. Um, and, uh, uh, and then the second building project is here. The book of Exodus ends with a public building project. Um, to build uh, this Mishkan, and it is elaborate and detailed and beautiful and poetic and rich. Um, so so we, have, we have a project at the beginning of the book and a project, a different type of project at the end of the book. Yes, I think it's necessary to ponder that in order to grasp the structure of the book of Exodus. So now, intervening between these two building projects, in the absence of Moses, the people, terrified, they want a Moses substitute, and Aaron, as you, as as we will read uh, this this coming Shabbat, right. I guess we're a week ahead. Right. Um, uh, 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 of course, Mo Aaron uh, helps them to design uh, in a in a way that he describes quite passively. When Moses said, "What did you do?" He says, "I just put in this gold, and it came out." Uh, but they wanted a substitute for Moses, and this enrages Moses and God. We don't quite know what that was about. Uh, and now we have an iteration of this building project of the Mishkan. It had already been described earlier. Uh, it, the project had been attended to in Pasha Truma. Right. Everybody whose heart so inclines him, let him give gifts. Um, and uh, this motif of the inclined heart, the voluntary gifts, is iterated again and again and again, particularly in our Pasha, Pasha Vayakhel. Right. But the, 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 the building of the golden calf, what was it? in that that was so odious and uh, what was the problem? Well, it's not clear, but we can begin to infer that introducing Shabbat here, and this is the second time it's introduced into the building project, we see it in Parsha Kitisa as well, has something to do with reflecting on, reflecting on the nature of work. Go back to Exodus chapter 1, 2, 3, slave conditions in Egypt. Their work is seen as, 
as it may even be construed from the book of Genesis, as a curse, as a major, horrible, hideous imposition that robs the human being of dignity. Right. Whereas over here, this building project is enabling the, a people to know that it lives in the presence of God. Vasuli mishkan v'shechanti b'tocham. They shall make for me a, 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 a dwelling place, and I'll dwell in their midst. Right? And that, there's an ambiguity in that verse. Is God in the house? In the, the and uh, uh, and of course the people believe that that's the case, but God doesn't, as He explains to Shlomo. We're reading in Haftor on the Solomon. Uh, uh, Haftor is building the temple, which is fixed in place. Right. This is the wandering, mobile Mishkan. Uh, historians would suggest it's a projection back into time, an anachronistic uh, envisioning of the uh, of the prototype that was in uh, uh, that was in uh, Jerusalem, built by Solomon. Yeah. Now, um, I'm thinking Shabbat takes precedence over the building of the temple. Why? Why is Shabbat more important than the building of the temple? I mean, we, the rabbis had to learn that life takes precedence over Shabbat. If somebody right. comes with, comes and, and threatens me with uh, with death on Shabbat, I can do anything I need to do to defend myself. Well, the, the whole Torah that. is, in a sense, a setting of priorities, one by it, one. Very much so, yeah. And Shabbat is top, right? So among the Ten Commandments, Shabbat, not the Mishkan. Um, you know, already in the setting of creation, chapter one, Shabbat. So now, I think his most beautiful book, is this gem by Heschel, which I couldn't help but bring to the table, okay. the Sabbath, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. And he says it so beautifully, I'm just going to let us hear his words. He says, when history began, there was only one holiness in the world, holiness in time. When at Sinai, the word of God was about to be voiced, a call for holiness in man was proclaimed. Thou shalt be unto me a holy people. It was only after the people had succumbed to the temptation of worshiping a thing, a golden calf, that the erection of a tabernacle of holiness in space was commanded. The sanctity of time came first, the sanctity of man came second, and the sanctity of space last. Time was hallowed by God. Space, the tabernacle, was consecrated by Moses. Right. So you're sitting in Tel Aviv, I'm in New Haven. We have created a space. Some people call it a holy land, others a promised land your friend Ari Shavit, others would call it a homeland. We Jews have built a home. And, uh, and the question is whether that home is a place in which we can experience not only the presence of God, whatever that means, right. but experience Shabbat Shabbaton, a total cessation. In other words, in some deep sense, you're not home unless you can cease from work. So we were not at home in Egypt. Shabbat HaGadol, the Sabbath before Passover, maybe marks the first Shabbat. I imagine the slaves in exhaustion and Moses having negotiated successfully with Pharaoh, collapsing. Right. You know, But a Shabbat when you're not exhausted but that, and you've got much responsibility upon you, but you stop. The ability to do that is challenged by the responsibilities incumbent upon us for keeping a state of Israel alive. And in some deep sense, that is the spiritual challenge of our people today. How do you live in the world with all that is required to protect yourself in the world and also not lose the taste for Shabbat Shabbaton? Now, the people here were, they, they brought so many goods, the Parsha goes on to tell us, so many products to the, uh, um, to the, to the creation. It was again and again, nidaba, nidaba, baboker, baboker, free right, offer, the, the sense of volunteering, no courage, of giving. No taxation. This, go ahead. Yeah, well, there, there is a wonderful story that uh, I, I think Rashi brings to the table when he talks about the, the giving of, of the Israelites and he talks about the women giving mirrors to yeah, Moses. Uh, yeah. you, you might remember, these are the mirrors with, with which they uh, beautify themselves to, to attract the men. And Moses says, well, I don't know, I don't want such mirrors. And God tells him, I, I do want those mirrors because thanks to those mirrors, we have so many children we had so many children in Egypt. So, so the sense of volunteering, of giving things to the tabernacle is, is very vivid in this parsha. Oh, that's very beautiful. You're making the connection. I, was, I, was, I wanted to go there. I didn't know how we would do it. Marvelous. <laughs> Marvelous. Yes. So there's something in this overpouring, this, this overflow that is erotic and that is super saturated. And the people have to be stopped. It's so interesting. It, a voice goes through the machanev, through the camp, and, and it says... Uh, 
may, uh, I don't know, mutate, I guess. Mm. The people were restrained from giving. They had to be stopped, forcibly stopped. It puts one in mind of the overflowing Nevu'ah prophecy in Medad and Eldad in, in uh, Sefer Bamidbar, mm. where Joshua but scared that people are freely prophesying. Yeah, he wants to stop them. them. Stop them. Yeah. Put them in jail. So here the people have to be forcibly stopped. So there's something about stopping when you're in the throes of productivity that may have something to do with the very process by which the golden calf came out. I mean, a people that couldn't produce what Aaron produced could not produce a Mishkan. But a people... But we want to be able to produce a work that doesn't enslave us. And this, of course, is, again, one of the great challenges of modernity, where supposedly we've created a possibility for leisure for ourselves like no other period in human history. And yet we're becoming enslaved to our own technologies. And, uh, and so how do you rest? How do you stop? How do you receive? How do you become passive? How do you see Kodesh, you know, meaning the mystery of what is? These challenges, I think, are here as the book ends with this glorious project of building, and of course the very end of the book, where the, where the Mishkan is completed, the man who sanctifies it, as Heschel puts it, Moshe, cannot go in. Right. He cannot enter it. I don't know what to make of that. He doesn't enter the land, and he cannot, at the end of Sefer Shemot, enter the Mishkan. Uh, quite interesting. Something about the nature of holy space and holy time. Here I'm, I'm, I'm breathless. <laughs> <laughs> So we'll, we will make our stop here, and uh, I thank you, and uh, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Good talking to you, Shmo. Thank you.